So I'm a simple fisherman. It was the only life I ever really knew was what we did to, to pay the bills and to take care of things. But one day, this guy named Jesus approached me and my brother, and we were fishing. And there was just something about him. There was something attractive. There was something just so, I don't know, warm about him, something that just intrigued us and drew us to him. And he said to us, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I never quite understood what he was talking about initially when he said that, but I was intrigued by it. And there was just something different about this guy, how he treated you, what he was doing, and so we were excited to follow him. So at that moment, we just left and we followed him. My name was Simon, but he gave me a different name. He called me Peter. He said he was going to use me uh, to build his church and to be part of the work that he was doing here on the earth. And the things I saw happen with Jesus, just walking with him and just going on trips with him and just seeing what he did, it was incredible. I'm, I'm lost for words at the things that we have experienced recently. You see, some of the things I've seen from Jesus, I remember one time we went fishing and we didn't catch anything. And that happens from time to time, right? And he said, put your nets down. And we thought to ourselves, well, that's you know, a lot of work to bring this stuff up. But because he said so, we thought, you know what, we're going to lower these nets. And you should have seen the haul of fish we had that day. You see, this Jesus really hung out with anyone. He hung out with the people that people said you shouldn't hang out with, the people who were you know, often marginalized by others. He hung out with them. He spent time with them. He even went near people that you weren't supposed to go near, people with diseases, and he would even dare to touch them and help them and love them. I remember this one time he fed over 5,000 people. Uh, there was this boy who had a couple loaves of bread and fish with him, and, and Jesus just multiplied that and fed a whole crowd of people. He broke rules sometimes, and sometimes the religious leaders got a little bit upset with him. He helped people. He healed people. The miracles are just unending. What an amazing experience it has been to be with him. And I promised him, near the end of his life, he started saying things like he might have to go. And I promised him I would never, ever, 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 ever leave him. But I did. I denied what I knew was true. And to be honest with you, that's, that's been tough tough to deal with. And then Friday came, and he was crucified, and he was hurt, and I had to watch him there in pain. And he breathed his last, and he said the words, it is finished. But what was finished? Was everything just done now? I don't have all the answers at the moment. It's been a tough thing for me to accept. But one thing I do know is I still have to make a living, and life has to go on. And so I have gone back to fishing, the one thing I've always known. But then something happened. I'm devastated. Maybe you're wondering what's wrong, but that's too simple of a question. It's such a complex answer. I had felt in the moment all hope was lost. It was dark, and I mean really, really dark. As it was earlier in my life, it was a darkness I've never known before, a darkness that didn't just surround you but crept into your soul and smothered you. I've been that dark before. Of course I had. I remember clearly the days of the possession, the days when I didn't know what I was doing, what I was saying, or where I was going, who I even was. But then that changed. He spoke. Jesus spoke. He knew my name. And at his word, the darkness lifted. The shadow was gone, and I was this new woman. A new life started, a life of adventure and discovery, a life where who I am was linked to who he is. And for the first time, the very first time, I knew that my life had a purpose, it had meaning. There was so much joy and so much laughter. We shared meals together, days together. 
Jesus would speak with words of such power and authority. And they weren't always easy words to listen to, not always comforting words, but I knew nothing would ever be the same again. We had spent so much time with Jesus. We thought we understood. We thought that we knew where this was all going. We believed the claims that he made of himself. We believed in him. We followed him. How wrong could have I been? After the devastation that I saw on Friday, after the silence of the Sabbath, and then early on this first day, me and Joanna and Mary and Salome and the others had gone to the tomb with the spices. We loved Jesus, but he was dead. So on that Sunday morning, we wanted to anoint him with spices and oil, honor him. We prepared them all, not even knowing how we were going to move that stone out of the way. And there it was, this gaping entrance, revealing this empty tomb. Like, did someone take him? Who, who would take my Jesus? You have to understand my confusion. We were in tears. We were in deep grief and hopelessness and still crying when Peter and the others arrived. And they were no better than me. And then it was just me sitting there trying to piece it all together. If Jesus couldn't keep himself alive, what was the point? Was he not who he said he was? I followed him because I believed the claims that he made of himself. I thought he was our savior. How could I be a follower of Christ with no Christ? And then something happened. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Easter service this evening. My name is not Peter, and I'm not standing with Mary, but I'm Pastor Jordan, and this is Pastor Yasmin. But the reason why we started that way, to be honest with you, is because we wanted to give you a look into what it might have felt like for the original audience at that Easter time and that day in between, that time in between, the crucifixion and resurrection, and what that might have felt like Kind of like the time where people's hopes were dashed and people were kind of going through, I'd say, a difficult time. But let's start by asking this. Let's talk a second about expectations. Does anyone here have expectations? Yeah? Pastor Yasmin, do you have expectations? Yeah, it just depends which ones you're asking. Like okay. my daily expectations or like my life expectations. Well, you give me some daily ones. <laughs> but daily, I expect the sun to come up in the morning. Yeah, exactly. I expect hot water. Yeah. Um, My car yes. to start, okay, which sometimes doesn't happen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we do uh, hot north. shower, right? Yeah. yeah. Coffee. What about you? Coffee, yeah. Coffee or tea? Coffee something or hot. tea? Yeah. yeah. I expect that spring arrives before April. Anyone? Right? Okay, <laughs> we're struggling with that one a little bit back, here. You might need to keep okay. your expectations low. <laughs> <laughs> but we all have expectations, and the truth is, is that when our expectations are met, we're usually happy. We're usually excited, and we usually feel good, and sometimes we just take it for granted, and we, we just, it, life just kind of goes on. Your expectations were met. Things came to be. But when our expectations are not met, we see another side of ourselves sometimes, right, who's not quite as happy. And if we're honest with ourselves, you know, we have expectations about so much, whether it's about work, whether it's about our family. You know, I expect my kids to sleep till at least 7 a.m., right? And that doesn't yeah, sorry always... about that. Yeah, not this morning, though, right? <laughs> yeah, that doesn't always happen, and that didn't happen this morning. It's funny. I went to two drive throughs today to get two different orders, and both of them were completely wrong when I left. And it's almost like God was saying he wanted to teach me something about this, right? But we all have expectations. Sports, you know, I've been let down so many times by things I expect to happen there and expectations are good to have but when your expectations aren't met it can kind of leave you angry upset and let down right well and often I don't even know it's an expectation until it doesn't happen exactly right what yeah. that feels like yeah 100 percent you just know that something didn't go the way you wanted it to go and so it's no surprise that for many how they felt after Jesus was crucified it's no surprise that their hopes had faded mm-hmm and that their expectations were all of a sudden just kind of gone. 
and they didn't know what to think, and they were left in a moment of disillusionment. You see, Peter went back to fishing and the stuff he did before meeting Jesus. Mary's off to anoint the body to prepare it for burial. You could read about those accounts in John and the Gospel of Mark. And we have another story where the expectations of two men have gone, and they document their doubts, and it's found in Luke chapter 24, and it's called, well, it, some Bibles call it the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus. And so two men are on the road to Emmaus, and they're talking about everything that had happened over the last little while. It's almost like they're reminiscing and sharing observations. And all of a sudden, Jesus approaches them, but the scriptures tell us that they couldn't recognize him, or that they were kept from recognizing yeah. who he was. And Jesus asks them the question, what is it that you men are discussing on the road? And have you ever been the last person to ever find out about something? You ever experienced that in your life? Lots. Right? Yeah. And it sucks. It, you show up, and everyone knows exactly what's going on, and you're like, duh, right? You, you know, it was like there was an election. You have no idea what happened the next day, right? <laughs> That's kind of what's happening here. They say to him, you know, have you not heard about the things that have happened here recently? Because what has happened in this past week to some people, as in those in the Roman Empire and in the religious teacher category, they thought it was completely justified probably and completely right. But for many others, it marked a moment where their hopes were crushed. It was disappointment, sadness, despair set in. What once held such promise just a couple days ago, what looked so hopeful and so certain at one time in life, was now fading fast and put to an end. And when Jesus died, their hopes, in a sense, had died. Mm. And for these men on the road, not knowing that they are, in fact, talking to Jesus himself, they ask him the question, are you the only one visiting here that does not know the things that have happened here this past week? Yeah, so um, I like to call this portion of scripture the doubting disciples. Yeah, <laughs> you were saying that this <laughs> And week. we're seeing this doubt and this hope, and we saw that in Peter, and we saw that in Mary when we shared those monologues with you as, as well. And in this portion that Pastor Jordan is just sharing, I want to point out Luke 24, 21. Um, if you want to pull up that whole scripture on there. And the next slide, we're going to look um, starting at verse 19. And as the men are talking back and forth after Jesus asked them what they're talking about, it says, about Jesus of Nazareth, you can go to the next slide. They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And the part that I want to point out is this, but we had hoped. They had hoped. They had hoped that he was the one. They didn't follow Jesus because just what he did and what he taught, but who he claimed to be. Who they thought perhaps he was, and then he dies and they think, oh my goodness, we must be wrong. And Mary and these other women did try coming and telling them that he had risen, but they didn't believe him. They called their story an idle tale, in some versions it says. They didn't know what to do or what to believe anymore. They're blind. They don't even know that they're talking to Jesus at this point. And what's interesting when they respond to the stranger, to Jesus, is they call Jesus a prophet. And we had kind of been discussing this because up until this point, they believed he was the savior. He was the son of God. So it's interesting that they call him a prophet here. And maybe that could be because prophets die, humans die. Maybe that's because they're doubting themselves. They're doubting who Jesus was, if, if he was a false prophet. Who knows? But in our moments when our expectations are let down, we think all kinds of things. Some that have truth and some that don't. We doubt ourselves. Either way, I think we can see and appreciate that they were crushed. I'm sure they must have felt betrayed by Jesus himself. What would they do now, right? Go back to the villages, go back to fishing, to tax collecting, to carpentry, like as if nothing happened over the past three years. This deep sense of disappointment that they would have had because they believed that he would redeem Israel for them. 
Yeah. And, and, and as they're walking, Jesus then starts to remind them about all sorts of things. He starts talking about the prophets of the old. He starts talking about the scriptures and opening them to them. And it's almost like he has this idea, like, you guys should have caught this. You guys should know kind of what's happening here. And he's explained this to them, and it's getting late at night, so they go into a shelter, and they're sitting down, they're about to have something to eat, they're about to break some bread. And as that happens, all of a sudden they recognize, their eyes are open, and they recognize that they're talking to Jesus. And then he just vanishes, and he just kind of disappears in that moment. And then they said this, they, they said this in the verse, they said, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures? to us. And so something obviously happened. Something had changed. And they were just getting awareness of this, that something big had happened. And so what happened, Pastor Yasmin? So looking at Mark 16, and we're going to con continue with Mary Magdalene's story here about the, what suddenly happened, was when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb. But when they look up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. So that's the something that happens. Her expe expectations have been crushed. She's lost all hope. And then Jesus does something that none of us could have ever dreamed of doing. He lives. It's, it's mind-blowing that the resurrection is actually where our faith as Christians begins. We celebrate lots of different things as Christians, but this, the resurrection, him living is where our faith begins. Without Christ, we can't be Christians. Mm -hmm. And this is where it happens. He far exceeds what we ever could have expected and hoped for. He is not dead. He is alive. He is here tonight. Amen. And to that we say a big amen this evening. And first Peter, yes, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> In first Peter chapter one, verses three to four, we read these words. It says, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Building on this, on this truth. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. And I love how the author describes it here by saying new birth. What's the first thing you think of when you think of new birth? Babies. Yeah, you think of babies, I right? I think of babies and all <laughs> this like whole life that they have ahead of them, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's, when, when, when you see a baby, it's so cute and whatnot, but you recognize that something new has happened and there's mm -hmm. something here and there's possibilities ahead. And so out of the, all the images to be used, one of the early images that the early Christians tapped into was this image of birth. Because when something new is born, there are fresh new possibilities. Something new has begun. Things are no longer the same as they once were, but they have changed. Birth takes us from what hasn't been seen to what is now being revealed. Tomorrow no longer has to be a repeat of today or yesterday, but there can be a disruption and things can go in a new direction. Amen? Amen. Resurrection is described to us as new birth into a living hope, not a dead hope, but hope that's alive through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, new birth was one of the ways in which the early church described what Jesus did for us. And so we can be hopeful today that because Jesus rose from the dead, all sorts of new possibilities have been opened up. Tomorrow does not have to be just like today, but it can be different. I love that. Maybe you are here today and you have regrets of the past and you've carried these things and you've held on to these things. And these things maybe have lingered longer than they should have. And you've bought into the deception that these things will always sort of follow you around and they'll always define you. But the scriptures suggest to us that that is just not true. Because of resurrection, we experience new birth. And so we believe in new births. We believe that things can die and other things can be reborn.
And I believe that we can leave behind certain things. We can leave shame behind. We can leave, you know, certain feelings of the past behind. And we can step into a new tomorrow because of what Jesus has done for us. Mm -hmm. Watchman Nee, a theologian of years past, said it like this. He said, our old history ends with the cross. Our new history begins with the resurrection. And so the cross and resurrection, they speak of a debt that was paid, one that we could never, ever pay for on our own. How many of you have ever been in a restaurant and had someone take care of your bill? Anyone? Have you been there, Pastor I, Yasmin? I have, yeah. Yeah? I have. You've been there? Yeah. How do you it, feel in that moment? Well, it's a good feeling because you feel <laughs> extremely blessed, but in the same sense, you feel like, well, no, like I can pay for my own, right? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you fight it a bit because you're like, oh, you didn't have to do that for me, right? And yeah. it's, it's true. They didn't have to do that for you probably, right? But, you know, this reminds me of a gospel truth that we can never, ever, ever, ever pay this bill on our own. Mm -hmm. We needed him to do it for us. And because of what he did on the cross, because of resurrection, the cross and resurrection speak of a debt that we could never cover. A debt so big that it can cause us great stress and shame and fear and, and, and just the feeling of drowning in your own sin. But because of Christ's death and resurrection, we no longer have to pay for such things. But the price is paid. Amen. And our sins have been forgiven. And our future is renewed with new things on the horizon. Thanks be to God. N.T. Wright, a current New Testament theologian, says this. He says, without the resurrection, even this, the story of Jesus is a tragedy. Certainly in first century Jewish terms, as a two on the road to Emmaus knew very well. But with the resurrection, there's a new way of telling the entire story. The resurrection isn't just a surprise, happy ending for one person. It is instead the turning point for everything else. And so, yes, church, the resurrection does promise us everlasting life. Amen? Mm -hmm. But it is also the beginning of something new for you and me right here, right now. You see, the big story in Scripture isn't just that we abandon this place called earth, but the big story in Scripture is that God has not abandoned this place called earth and has not abandoned people. Amen? Yeah. And he is begun to renew and redeem and re reconcile others to him. And so recon or sorry, resurrection has implications not just for your future, but also for today. Right here, right you now. see, the resurrection of Jesus is the affirmation of God's love for humanity. It reminds us that everything Jesus says was true, and we can trust him. It brings us into a life of faith that's living and active. Can I say it like this? The resurrection kind of affirms a switching of empires. You see, the empire that put Jesus to death was an empire that was a, an empire of, of force and anger and greed and evil. But Jesus, in fact, establishes something new, a, a kingdom called the kingdom of heaven that will not be known by those things, but will be known by hope and peace and faith and love and joy. And so rever the resurrection definitely has implications for us when we leave this earth. But we must not miss that the resurrection has implications also for how we live today. Mm -hmm. And it declares to us that, you know, Christ cares about every single one of us. This world matters to him. What we think and feel matters. What we do matters. What we create matters. What, who we help, love, and serve, it all matters to Jesus. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, are you giving your life to the kinds of things that matter and endure and go on in this new world that God wants to restore and redeem to himself? And our motivation in all this can't be just because we feel guilty or hopeless, but it's because Christ loves us, amen? Mm -hmm. Pastor Yasmin, why don't you tell us more about that? Yeah, and, and one of the things that I think, in light of this, that we should be showing is this word that we hear so often, all the time, and has so much meaning, is the word love. Mm -hmm. In this perfect love that we get from Jesus, and I, I think we all need to learn how to live this way. And I'll go as far as saying sacrificial love is what we're looking for. So there's a story um, that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, on the last night when Jesus uh, was on earth, he's with his disciples, and he decides to wash their feet, um, which speaks volumes of who our Savior is, who Jesus is. But there's this one verse that I want to share with you. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them till the end. Jesus loved them till the end. 
I love, love that it. so much. We were talking about this story on Unedited, and me and Pastor Jordan got so, like, kind of wrapped up in this one line, right? And so we went back into my office afterwards, and we were talking, and we wanted to kind of see what this word end meant in Greek. And Pastor Jordan had found two different definitions that I think is absolutely perfect to share, especially on this Easter weekend. So one of them was an end or a conclusion, which I think makes sense to most of us, or a goal or aim or fulfillment. See, I think it's perfect because it could mean that Jesus loved his disciples until the end of his life, or he loved them to the fullest extent possible. Mm -hmm. See, and I think it's safe to say that it was both right, mm -hmm. that it was both. Jesus loved his disciples until the crucifixion, and then in the crucifixion, we see the very depths, the sacrificial love that he had for them and for us. Jesus willingly laid down his life, was not taken by force. He was willing to sacrifice his life for our sin. He loved us enough to pay that ultimate price for us to be reconciled with God. And this should inspire nothing less than awe and wonder and insurance in us. And so I share this scripture that's probably very common to many people, but it's why I want to share it again, because I don't want it to become so common that it doesn't, that it loses its meaning. John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whomever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Love it. Second Corinthians chapter five is another verse that we just want to look at today because we want to f figure out what the so what of this whole um, th of this whole weekend is. And so these verses say, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so we see this idea repeated again in 2 Corinthians of new creation, of new identity. Not only are we made new, not only are we completely transformed, but now the scripture says we also need to represent. And we need to represent this kingdom that God has asked us to be a part of. And so... We see this word ambassador, that we're called Christ's ambassadors. And an ambassador really is a, a representative, right? Yeah. And uh, when you're an ambassador for a country, people should be able, just by coming in contact with you, of knowing what your country stands for yeah, well, and cares about just through your words and through your conduct. Yeah. Right? And so the same goes for those, I think, who follow Jesus. I think this is the language that we're getting at here in this portion. Because in some ways, you might be the only place where someone will have a, a chance to encounter Christ mm -hmm. and to encounter the gospel message and to encounter your Lord. And so we need to make sure that we're representing him, knowing that this isn't just a duty, but this is a delight. This is an honor. It's a privilege. And so how can we live in light of the resurrection? So I'm going to take you back to Mary at the tomb. Um, but this time it's from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 28, 1 to 10, it'll all come up, uh, but I'm going to just focus on one little area here. But they're approaching the tomb. There's an earthquake. The guards become like dead men. An angel explained to the woman, and then the angel explains to the woman that the Lord has risen. Now, I've read this countless times in my life, countless times over this last couple of weeks, and I still struggle to truly understand the magnitude of it all. Um, the mix of fear and grief and joy, but yet so quickly they obey the angel's instructions to share the news with his disciples. And so this is the part I want to focus on, verses 9 and 10. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. 
They came to him, clasped at his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So the immediate response is beautiful. They fall at his feet and they worship him. So in light of the resurrection, I think we can find a little bit of a pattern from Matthew 28 as a good place to start. So first, we worship. The women's response should be ours as well, where we sit at his feet and worship him, understand the magnitude and the price that he paid on our behalf. We're told to remember this thing of remembering over and over and over about what he did for us, the sacrifice that he made, and we worship him for it. Mm-hmm. The second thing is we choose joy. The first thing he says is rejoice. That's Jesus' greeting to the women. And we find our joy in Jesus, no matter our circumstances, no matter how unworthy we feel, he reminds us to take joy. If you've been around here for any length of time, it will be very familiar to you when I say rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice, right? (laughs) And then the third one is we forsake fear. The call to rejoice is followed by a phrase that we see repeated again and again and again in scripture. Do not be afraid. Right? In a world where we are scared and anxious and lost and hopeless, he says do not be afraid. Even the smallest awareness of who he is and what he's done and who I am and what I have done brings all of this um, immediate sinking feeling, and he gets it. He gets that feeling. He understands it from the very impulse, the very first impulse that you have to do those things, and he calls it out. He immediately says, do not be afraid. So the, I just believe it's the key we need. There's this hope that we long for when life feels like it's just too much, when our joy is stolen from the day-to-day things that seem to drown us. Don't be afraid. Mm-hmm. Choose joy. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth one, which could be the most important one, is we go and we tell. Mm-hmm. Pastor Jordan said that we are Jesus' ambassadors, right? So we go and tell. Like at Christmas time, we go and tell it on the mountain, right? In one simple conversation and a few short sentences, Jesus himself sums up themes that we read repeatedly and repeatedly throughout all of Scripture. He has redeemed and restored us, and now we are to forsake fear and live a life that speaks that, a life that speaks of him. So as his ambassadors, we go and we tell. Amen. But then you might ask me, how in the world are we supposed to do that? Mm-hmm. That sounds good sitting from our seats right now, right? But how are we supposed to do that? Well, let's read Romans 8, verse 11, and Paul tells us this. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who has raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's how we do this. This gift that he gave us, his spirit dells in you. It is in Jesus' resurrection power, biding us to worship, enabling us to choose joy, empowering us to forsake fear, and equipping us to go and tell. As his ambassadors, that makes all the difference. This is how we live in light of the resurrection. This is how we live from the empty tomb, by his power and his work in each of us Mm -hmm. every day. We can bury what you call the old life, right? Which we, we talked about today into this new and beautiful life following Jesus. And we're going to see a very beautiful picture of this in just a few moments here in baptisms where they have decided to make that choice and bury that old life and come up new following Jesus. Right? The old to the new. This is the greatest trade in the history of the world. Okay? And it's a free gift that costs us nothing, but cost him everything. Mm-hmm. So old or new? 
Old, sin. New, righteousness. Dead, alive. Darkness, light. Bondage, freedom. Separation, united with Christ. Lost, found. Baggage, purpose. Slave, son and daughter. Debt, paid for in full. Amen. Amen. Can you stand with us, please? Amen. <laughs> so this old to new, and the worship team can come up as well. This old to new seems like a pretty great deal for us, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus into this new birth, this new life. Maybe for some of you, it is the first time ever, or for others, maybe you haven't been baptized yet, or maybe you aren't living in light of what the resurrection represents. You're not being those ambassadors that Jesus has called you to be. Wherever you are this Easter, there is a next step for you as you leave here. Mm -hmm. There is something that God is calling you to do. He is here, and he's risen, and he loves you. So if you'd like to take this next step in faith and say yes to Jesus for the very first time, accept a gift of new life, new birth, you can do that right now. Right now in this moment. So with all your heads bowed and your eyes closed, across the whole auditorium. Let this just be a private moment between you and Jesus, whatever that next step may look for you. If you want to say yes today and live a new life, one that you could never even imagine that he has ahead for you, raise your hand and just keep your eyes closed, heads bowed. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to pray this all together after me. Make everybody feel comfortable here. Jesus, we want your mercy today. Jesus, we want your mercy today. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you died on the cross. And you paid for my sins. And you paid for my sins. I believe you are risen and you are here. I believe that you are risen and that you are here. I admit my need for you. I admit my need for you. I admit my need for a savior. I admit my need for a savior. And I'm inviting you to be mine right now. And I'm inviting you to be mine right now. Come into my life and forgive my sins. Come into my life and forgive my sins. Live in me and lead me by your Holy Spirit. Live in me and lead me by your Holy Spirit. I bury my old life. I bury my old life. And I walk into a new life that you've provided for me. And I walk into a new life that you provided for me. Amen. Amen. If you prayed this today for the very first time, I rejoice and I celebrate with you. I, I truly Absolutely. do. And there were some that did today. So yes, that does deserve a celebration, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. He is Amen. risen. It is Thank Easter you, weekend and people are accepting Jesus. Uh, there's a connect card you can fill out. If you have questions, we'd love to chat with you. If you would like, if it's your first time, you can go from there. But Pastor Jordan is going to close us in prayer, and we're going to go into a time of worship and the best part of the service baptisms. Yeah, absolutely. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much that we have so much to celebrate today. Thank you for the hope that you've given us. Thank you that we are not left hopeless, but that we have a hope that is a living, active, and alive, and that, Lord, you have done so much for us, God. We're just thankful people today. Help us, Lord, to go out into the world and represent you well. Help us to speak of you. Help us to worship you. Help us, Lord, just to live a life of joy, God, and just to walk with you each day. And so I pray for each one here today, Lord, that we would just, in a special way this Easter weekend, just once again recognize the hope and the joy and the goodness that we have because of what you did. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.